Good afternoon. How's everybody doing today? It's good to be back and see all your smiling faces today. Um, today we are diving into a talk related to a trip that has been organized through the center here, uh, a trip to Italy. Now, last time this trip to Italy was planned was about three years ago, wasn't it? And I came and gave a talk about Italy then, and it didn't really work out for any of us. Uh, so hopefully things go better this time around. Uh, today, we are going to be looking at the architecture of Rome. Um, how many of you have been to Rome? Have any of you been to Rome before? Rome's, Rome's a pretty impressive city. Uh, it is a grand city. It is a city that for centuries was the center of a global empire, a superpower. It is the center of a global religion today. It's the capital of Italy. It has a tremendously, tremendously long and rich and complex and tragic and triumphant history. It is really a, a magnificent, magnificent city. Uh, Rome is roughly 27, 2800 years old. So it's a pretty old city. Uh, most archaeologists think that Rome was established, or that the earliest inhabitants of the area of Rome arrived in the region sometime in the middle of the 8th century BCE. And in fact, the Romans do celebrate uh, the year 735 BCE as the birth date of Rome. In fact, April 21st is the official birth date of Rome. Uh, and they say Rome wasn't built in a day, right? So we have a birth date of Rome. They have a big party or celebration every year in Rome to celebrate this fact. So what we are looking at today is going to be kind of a broad history of Rome, a broad history through the built environment, through the structures, the buildings, the temples, the churches, other things of the city of Rome. And it really is a fascinating history. Some of the buildings are remarkably beautiful. Some of them are a little bit controversial. We'll dive into all of these topics as we make our way through our uh, Roman travels here. I called the talk Eternal. Why? What's well, one of Rome's nicknames? Eternal. The Eternal City. The city that has been there for a very, very long time and will hopefully be there for a long time to come. So let's dive into this architectural grandeur of Rome. Now before we start looking at actual buildings, here's a couple of thoughts to keep in mind as we um, think about architecture and think about Rome itself. Uh, two 19th century authors, John Ruskin, an Englishman, uh, literary critic, art, art critic, uh, pretty famous guy, writes a collection of works on architecture. And in those works, called The Seven Lamps of Architecture, he says, when we build, let us think that we build forever. We are building for permanence. We are building for a long, long time. Well, the Romans certainly did that. And we have evidence of that in Rome itself. The other author here is, um, I don't know if anybody's heard of this guy. His name is Mark Twain. <laughs> Mark Twain, in uh, the 1860s, took a journey from the United States through the Mediterranean, ultimately ending up in the Holy Land. Uh, he writes an account of this journey on a boat with uh, other American tourists. Uh, it's called The Innocents Abroad. And on this journey, they do stop in Rome. And uh, Mark Twain records his impressions of Rome. He is kind of uh, overwhelmed by the antiquity of it. He's shocked by some of the, what he thinks is the uh, overwhelmingness of the city itself, the, the overwhelming decorations of churches, the overwhelming scale of some of the structures. But he says, from the dome of St. Peter's, one can see every notable object in Rome. He can see a panorama that is very extensive, beautiful to the eye, and more illustrious in history than any other in Europe. Now, Mark Twain was a very well-traveled man. And he, here he is in Rome at the top of St. Peter's, taking in that view, uh, overlooking the city of Rome, overlooking centuries, millennia of history spread out before him here. Now, this is a relatively modern view from the, uh, the dome of St. Peter's. If we look out, you can see the Castel Sant'Angelo over here. I'll talk about that later on. The Tiber River, which is really the, um, the reason why Rome exists where it exists. Uh, and a lot of the monuments of ancient Rome over here, including the Pantheon over here. Uh, the Colosseum is back over there. You can barely make it out. These, these famous structures that all tell part of the story of the history of Rome. Everything can be seen from this vantage point overlooking the city itself. Uh, here's a wonderful view of the Tiber at night. St. Peter's there in the background. You get a sense of how, how looming the, the uh, Vatican is, how looming St. Peter's Basilica is. 
Now, technically, St. Peter's is not in Rome. It is in Vatican City, but Vatican City is surrounded by Rome, so if you go to Rome, you end, end up in Vatican City. Um, and it is really a, a remarkable place that is overwhelming in its scale. And I'll, I'll show you some more pictures of uh, St. Peter's in a little bit. So where do we begin our story of looking at Rome? We could certainly start in the period of ancient Rome. Um, now, the early centuries of Rome, in the early centuries of Rome, the city was growing dramatically during the Roman Republic, but it was also um, falling into ruin. There are numerous civil wars that occur in Rome. And it isn't really until the, the reign of the first Roman emperor, <coughs> Augustus, that we begin to see many of the uh, monuments that we are familiar with today. Now, Augustus, like any Roman emperor, had a pretty good opinion of himself, I guess. <laughs> um, and he famously says, I'm not going to read the Latin because that would just embarrass me, but he famously <laughs> says, I found Rome a city of bricks and left it a city of marble. So he came into Rome, a Roman city that had been prosperous for centuries, that was really the center of a growing empire, but this Roman Republic, at the end of the Roman Republic, and he made it monumental. He built temples, he built monuments, he built altars, he built palaces. And all of those were grand, sparkling white marble. So what we see during the Augustan age, the, the beginning of the imperial period in Rome, is really a, a building boom. Each of the emperors that succeeded Augustus wanted to add something to the city, wanted to leave their imprint on the city not just historically, but in terms of the physical building that went on in Rome. So we see a lot of, um, a, a lot of architecture and art created during the imperial period in Rome. We'll take a quick look at some of the important monuments from this time period. The one that is perhaps one of the most important monuments associated with Augusta, uh, Augustus is this, the Arapaches, the Altar of Peace. This is a... Um, kind of a mini sacrificial altar that's located right along the banks of the Tiber. It was meant to celebrate peace and prosperity in the Roman Empire. Of course, under Augustus, he essentially had control of the entire Mediterranean. We enter into this period of Roman dominance in the Mediterranean where there was uh, far-reaching peace, there was economic prosperity. We're entering into a golden age in Roman history. So Augustus builds this altar that celebrates his peace, his rule over the Roman world. The altar itself is de decorated with uh, these intricate floral patterns with scenes from Roman history depicting gods and heroes and Augustus in various uh, guises as he guides Rome into this prosperity. And it is today conserved in a uh, basically a plexiglass shell surrounds it. They built a museum around the altar there by the banks of the, uh, the Tiber River. So this is one of the important monuments that is constructed during Augustus's time. It's one of those examples of marble replacing brick in the city of Rome itself. Now Augustus does build himself a fancy palace up on the Palatine Hill. Uh, we only have the ruins of that today. He does build a grand mausoleum for himself, uh, basically across the street from this along the Tiber River. That is basically in ruins today. Uh, it's been restored so you can kind of see what Augustus's tomb looked like. But much of what Augustus does in terms of building is to inspire later emperors to keep adding grand monuments to the city itself to memorialize themselves in these wonderful structures. So we have this example from the time of Augustus. Now one of the areas in Rome that was the focus of a lot of this growth, the focus of a lot of this, this monumentality was the Roman Forum. The Roman Forum was the downtown, the ceremonial, the business center, the religious center of Roman towns and Roman cities. Everywhere the Romans went, wherever they established a settlement, wherever they established a town, they had a small forum. When you go to Pompeii, those of you who are going on this trip, there is a forum in Pompeii, and all the important temples were right there in the vicinity of the forum. This was the urban center, the civic center of Roman communities. And it was a place where Roman emperors and other significant people could display their prominence, display their wealth by building monuments, by building statues, by uh, erecting triumphal arches, and that sort of stuff. So we have these two views of the Roman form here. This is pretty much what it looks like today. This is what it would have looked like during the glory days of Rome in about the second century. Um, that's a pretty good illustration over here. It's missing one thing, though, the crowds. <laughs> the people. 
Rome was a very densely populated city. At one point in antiquity, it has a population of more than a million people, which is unheard of at that time. So there would have been a lot more people crowding around over here. Priests and soldiers and politicians and lawyers and beggars, all of those people would have mingled here in the Roman Forum. So this is really the epicenter of the Roman Empire. This is where business was conducted. This was where imperial law was made. This was the center, uh, the heart of Rome itself. Now, uh, this is the called the Roman Forum. Successive emperors, successive rulers of Rome did create their own fora in the vicinity of the Roman Forum. This map kind of lays it up. This is the Roman Forum here. This is the Colosseum. You'll probably see that when you're in Rome. Uh, other emperors, other leaders do create public areas along the way. So here's Augustus's Forum. There's Caesar's Forum. This is the Forum of Trajan over here. This is the Capitoline Hill, uh, where the Grand Temple to, uh, to Jupiter was uh, built. Jupiter was the king of the Roman gods. He was Zeus, basically, the Roman version of Zeus. And that overlooked this grand form. He had numerous temples and other stuff over here. And down here, you had the Palatine, where all the imperial palaces were built. So you have this layout of the heart of ancient Rome right there. As I said, in the Forum were numerous monuments. People erected monuments, emperors erected monuments to celebrate their accomplishments, their victories in war, and that sort of stuff. One of those monuments is this, the Arch of Titus. Titus was a first century Roman emperor, and this arch was constructed around 81, the year 81, to celebrate Roman victory in Palestine, in what is today the Holy Land. Uh, there had been a, a Jewish revolt in Palestine, in the first century, the Romans had to struggle to suppress this Jewish, re Jewish revolt. And around the year 80 or so, the Romans succeed in suppressing this result, revolt, stamping their control over the province of Judea, as the, was the name of the Roman province. So the emperor decides to build a victory arch to celebrate this, this conquest, to celebrate the end of this struggle. And this is the arch right over here. Uh, Inside the arch, you can make it out just barely on that picture, here's a, a, a close-up of it, were sculptures depicting the Roman victory in Judea. One of the um, results of that victory was that the Romans sacked and destroyed the Temple of Jerusalem, which was the holiest site in Judaism. That was, the Romans ransacked it, they took the treasures from the temple, they tore the temple down. Uh, today in Jerusalem, you have the remnants of that second temple. That, that is the, the Wailing Wall at the, the foot of the uh, Temple Mount. And what this depicts are Roman soldiers carrying the booty away from the Temple in Jerusalem. Uh, various treasures and standards, and this thing right here, uh, giant menorah, that was all carried away. Supposedly, the Romans also carried away from the Temple the Holiest of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. Those of you who remember your Indiana Jones movies. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant is carried away by the Romans, so it does spend time in Rome. Who knows where it ends up after that. Uh, but uh, the Romans do take the golden box from the Temple of Jerusalem, bring it to Rome as booty in this conquest. So we see that celebrated here in this Arch of Titus. A short way away from the Arch of Titus, and about 140 years later, is the Arch of Septimius Severus. Septimius Severus was an emperor of Rome in the early third century. Um, which would turn out to be a bad period in Roman history. Not just Septimius Severus, but the third century in general. And what we see in this arch is that it's certainly much more elaborate than Titus's arch. It is um, kind of a triple arch of these two smaller passageways there, the grand one here in the middle, very heavily decorated, showing the exploits of Septimius Severus and celebrating his military victories and his view of himself as a god. Uh, Again, the Roman emperors did have kind of a high opinion of themselves. Um, and it is an example of later, a later style of Roman art, of Roman architecture itself. Um, it's a pretty impressive structure. But Septimius Severus, the man who built it, was crazy, I guess is a good way of describing it. Um, he, is, he is one of a series of Roman emperors in the third century that really uh, begin to weaken the Roman Empire. Um, up until about 180, with the death of the emperor uh, Marcus, Marcus Aurelius, Rome is ruled by generally well-conditioned, um, well-versed leaders. 
A lot of those Roman emperors are good emperors, good rulers. They have their foibles, of course, but there are a couple of crazy ones in there also. But what we see after Marcus Aurelius is a steady decline in the quality of leadership over the course of the third century, and that leads to various crises within the Roman Empire itself. Um, invasions from outside, an economic downturn. Uh, in the middle of the third century, you have a series of emperors. You have about 20 emperors in about 26 years. So you have this rapid turnover. Uh, the emperor's bodyguards, the Praetorian guards, essentially assassinate emperors and then uh, sell off the office of emperor to whoever is the highest bidder. Uh, it becomes a very unstable position. Yet, despite that, Rome is still largely prospering. It is still the center of empire. So we have a lot of things that are right here in this arch. Um, in the Roman Forum, again, a short distance kind of between the Arch of Septimius Severus and the Arch of Titus, is this building, the Basilica of Maxentius. Now, when you hear the word basilica, what do you think of? A church. A church. You think of a big church, right? Uh, and in much modern usage, that's what they refer to. But the term basilica itself, with a small b, actually refers to a specific form of building that the Romans developed. Uh, a building that has a large central space and then essentially aisles off to the side. In the Roman world, basilicas were public buildings where law courts were held, where lawyers had offices, where other public business was conducted. These were essentially kind of the, uh, I don't want to call them the town halls, but they were kind of the public meeting spaces within Roman towns, within Roman cities, where lots of stuff went on. Sometimes there was commercial activity, there was often legal activity that took place in them. This basilica, the Basilica of Maxentius, is one of the largest that was constructed in the Roman world. And it becomes a model for later architectural buildings, later architectural developments. Uh, it, even in the modern world, in the 19th and 20th century, we see the basilica form looming large. You kind of get a sense of scale here with the size of this building. You can see the uh, people over here in the foreground. It is a massive structure. And it is really, really impressive, um, these, these arches that make up the walls of that central part of the Basilica of Maxentius. This is an artist's reconstruction of what it may have looked like when it was new, when it was in operation. Uh, by the time this is built in the early 4th century, we're starting to stabilize the Roman Empire a little bit. A couple of um, really skilled emperors come to power that bring stability and, and uh, economic stability and economic prosperity back to the Roman world. Well. Has anybody seen a building that looks like this? Because there have been some famous buildings that do, are modeled after the Basilica of Maxentius. Here are two of them. This is Penn Station, the old Penn Station in New York City. Look at that form right there. This, also in New York. Anybody recognize that one? Might be more familiar than Penn Station. Uh, it's Ellis Island. It's the immigration station at Ellis Island. Again, that Basilica form. Wow. Right? Modeled after what the Romans used, what the Romans had. Now, why are a lot of churches called basilicas? Well, when Christianity is introduced into Western Europe, when it is legalized in the Roman Empire at the end of the 4th century, what shape were many of the early churches in? But they followed this Roman model, this thing that had been around for centuries. And basically, they built churches that looked like these basilicas. Tall in the middle, shorter aisles on the side, that, those arches to keep the entire structure up. That form becomes associated with churches in Western Christendom and eventually becomes associated with big Catholic churches around the world. So uh, the idea of the basilica is a Roman invention talking of a specific architectural form. It is one that has had a long history, long legs. We see it in relatively modern structures here. And that brings us to a structure that is just outside of the Roman Forum, at kind of one end of the, uh, the road that runs through the Roman Forum, but perhaps the best known building in all of Rome. The Colosseum. The Colosseum. Now technically, the Colosseum is not this building's official name. That is what it has been known, known as for um, 2,000 years, roughly. But it is actually not the name, it is called the, um, the Flavian Amphitheater. Why is it called the Flavian Amphitheater? Well, it was built by a dynasty of Roman emperors, the Flavian Dynasty. So it was the amphitheater built by the Flavians. Why is it called the Colosseum? It's not because of its size. It is the largest amphitheater in the Roman world. In fact, it's uh, bigger than, or about the same size as many 
modern football stadiums. Mm. It's called the Colosseum because there happened to be a giant statue of the Emperor Nero nearby, a Colossus of Nero. So this became the arena next to the Colossus of Nero, hence became the Colosseum. Uh, the statue of Nero is long gone, you won't find that in Rome, but you will find the Colosseum, perhaps the epitome of Roman architecture. The most famous building in Rome, uh, and really a, a testament to Roman engineering. Uh, a building that was designed to stand the test of time, and that over the course of its life has served a wide variety of purposes. Um, take a look at the interior over here of the Colosseum. It's a, mostly a ruin today, but in its day, when it was completed in the first century, it was, as I said, the largest amphitheater in the Roman world, had a seating capacity of somewhere between 50 to 55,000 people. And it was designed with such efficiency that supposedly it could be emptied in about eight minutes. Oh. So get those crowds out and into the streets of Rome in a matter of minutes. Have any of you been to a game at, at Gillette? Yeah. <laughs> How long does it take to get out of Gillette Stadium? <laughs> a lot longer than eight minutes. Um, so you have tremendously efficient engineering here with the Colosseum. Um, it was built out of concrete and stone. It was decorated with these this wonderful colonnade on the outside. And what we see in the colonnade is that down here you have Doric columns. Up here you have uh, Ionic columns, and up there you have Corinthian columns. As you go further up, the columns become fancier. Hmm. Um, so on the decorative elements there, you have all of these arches that are really um, the recognizable part of the Colosseum itself. The Romans are masters of using arches for building structures. This building becomes so associated with Rome that a legend springs up. It says, um, if the Colosseum ever collapses, Rome will collapse. And if Rome collapses, the world will end. So this building is uh, such a part of the fabric of Rome, such a part of the fabric of Roman uh, mythology and mystique, that it is tied to the existence of the, very, the, of the world itself. Now, the inside of the arena uh, of the, the Colosseum is, again, a, a, a testament to how clever the Roman engineers and Roman builders were. Uh, underneath the arena floor, which would have been here, you have all of these passageways, all of these chambers, uh, which were essentially the backstage area for the events at the Colosseum. That's where the gladiators got ready, that's where the wild animals were held, that kind of sprang up through the arena floor through the use of trap doors and elevators and things like that. It was a remarkable, remarkable structure that the Romans put so much planning into. And what was the purpose of the Colosseum? Why was it built? It was built to entertain the public. It was a, an arena, a place where, where massive events took place. Uh, to the Romans, they liked a lot of uh, violent entertainment. Uh, so you had gladiators fighting there. You had uh, gladiators fighting gladiators. You had gladiators yeah. fighting wild animals. You had wild animals attacking uh, criminals and Christians and others. Uh, you had naval battles that were staged in the Colosseum. It was designed so that it could be flooded and miniature boats could fight against one another to the, uh, to the entertainment of the people of Rome. So it really was this remarkable, remarkable structure that was meant to be the, uh, the circuses part of the bread and circuses. How do we keep the public from rioting? We make sure they're fed and we make, make sure they're entertained, which is something the Roman emperors took great care to do because you don't want an angry populace in Rome. Uh, out of the fringes of the empire, it's less important. But in Rome, where the emperor lived, you don't want people that angry. So you, you entertain them, you distract them. You use this structure as that, that site where those grand events take place. Uh, really, the Colosseum is, is a fantastic structure. When you go to Rome, um, it'll be remarkably crowded. And it'll lose some of its mystique because you're going to be in there with tens of thousands of other people. But you kind of have to step back and really look at it and think about the story of it to really appreciate what's going on there. Now, uh, why is the Colosseum in the state of disrepair that it's in? They used a stone for other purposes. Ah, the Romans caused a lot of damage to Rome. Uh, a lot of ancient Rome disappears because later Romans in the Middle Ages you know, I'm building a new house for myself, I need some columns. Where can I get some columns? Oh, I can take them from that yeah. old building over there that nobody's using. So the medieval Romans did a lot of damage to ancient Rome. Mm -hmm. 
And a lot of the stones from the Colosseum were stripped away by the Romans to go and build stuff that they needed at that time. Um, so it's, the Romans did more damage to Rome than a lot of the, uh, the invading barbarians did in a lot of ways. The barbarians knocked over a lot of statues. The Romans destroyed a lot of Roman buildings. So we have the Colosseum here in this uh, state of disrepair, but still a magnificent example of Roman architecture, really the symbol of Rome itself in a lot of ways. Uh, nearby to the Colosseum, kind of down the road, across from the, the uh, Imperial Roman Forum, is another forum that was designed and built by the Emperor Trajan in the second century. Trajan is one of the uh, longer lasting Roman emperors, really considered one of the the great emperors of the second century who extends the boundaries of the Roman Empire, uh, maintains peace and prosperity throughout the Mediterranean world, and like any good emperor, decided to build a forum, a forum for, to celebrate his, his position, to celebrate the prosperity of his empire. Trajan's forum is this space over here in front of us and this curved building here in the background. That curved building was a market stall. That was a market building. It was essentially the first indoor shopping mall. Uh, there were merchants that had their stores in that building. The citizens of Rome could go and purchase the things they needed, all while being indoors without being out in the, uh, you know, Rome gets more than 300 sunny days a year, but not being out in the Roman sunshine or those few days of Roman rain. You also have Trajan building a column over here, which uh, celebrated some of his army's military exploits in fighting against the, the Germanic tribes of Central Europe. Uh, so Trajan's column is here. Originally, this was topped with a statue of one of the Roman gods. When the Christians come along, they knock the Roman god off there and they stick a, an angel on the top of it, or a saint. I can't remember who's up there. But you see this kind of transformation in the uh, story of Rome played out in the architecture and in the ruins of what, what's left. Um, so we have Trajan's form. And that brings us to really my favorite building of ancient Rome, the Pantheon. The Pantheon, as the name implies, was built as a temple to all the gods. Uh, so Pantheon means all the gods. It was a house of worship built by the Romans in the first century, uh, rebuilt later on in the second century. The, the original building burns down, so they rebuild it to this form over here, around 126 or so. What's remarkable about the Pantheon is that its shape is revolutionary, it is unique, and is something that Europeans could not replicate for centuries. Um, what we see at the Pantheon is a traditional classical temple facade here with the pediment and the columns and this entryway in, but then a round building that has a gigantic dome over it. Um, the dome in the Pantheon, and here's an interior view of it, stretches some 43.3 meters from end to end. That is uh, 135 feet, something like that. It is even today, in the 21st century, the largest um, unreinforced concrete dome in the world. Uh, and for a while, this was the broadest span of dome anywhere in the world. It wasn't until the building of the Astrodome in the 1960s that the span of, of space that was domed was surpassed. So that's how, how great these Roman builders were. Now, what is the secret to the Pantheon's success? How can this structure survive for so long? Concrete. It has to do with the Roman concrete. Roman concrete was different than modern concrete. The Romans had a very special formula for concrete that made it very light, very strong, and actually able to repair itself. Uh, and part of the key to it was the fact that they used a lot of what's called tufa, volcanic stone, in the concrete, which kept the weight down, but increased the grit and the strength of the concrete itself. And in building the Pantheon, what the Romans did is they essentially built a giant cylinder with very, very thick walls, and then built this dome stretching this vast span, and the dome, the roof gets thinner and thinner and thinner as you approach the center. And in the center, you have an opening. It's called the oculus that illuminates the inside. It also reduces the weight of the dome itself. So you have this coffer dome, the coffering helps to, to reduce the weight, that is self-supporting, has that hole in the middle, allowing sunlight into the structure, that is uh, thin at the top, thicker at the bottom, supported by the drum of the building itself. It really is a remarkable, remarkable structure. And it is one of the best preserved Roman buildings in the city. Why is it so well preserved? 
Well, what happens to it when uh, the Christians come along and establish Christianity as the religion of Rome? It's converted into a church. So it has a long history as a pagan Roman temple, later converted into a Christian church, and that association with the Christian church maintains its, it keeps it in, intact. It's not sacked, it's not ruined, it's not burned down. It is maintained as a house of worship. It eventually becomes the burial place of the kings of Italy. There are two or three kings of Italy buried in the uh, Pantheon in Rome. And today it is one of the most visited sites in the city. Uh, somewhere about prior to the pandemic, it was getting about six to seven million visitors a year. Which means when you go to visit it, it's crowded. <laughs> Unless you're there first thing in the morning, you have these vast crowds in there. It is a magnificent building. Um, here's kind of a cutaway diagram of it. So you can see the stoutness of the walls over here as the dome gets thinner to the top. Now what's fascinating about it is that you could take a sphere with a diameter of 43.3 meters and place it inside the Pantheon and it would fit perfectly like we see here. The interior of it is essentially a perfect circle a perfect sphere. So the engineering skill of building this structure is really, really remarkable. And it is, um, it's an amazing building to look at and to go inside and just kind of see the vastness of the space and to, to realize that it's nearly 2,000 years old and it's almost in pristine condition. Uh, it really is magnificent. Well, eventually what happens to the Roman Empire? Uh, it falls apart. It, it's divided. You have the separation of Eastern and Western Roman Empire. And the Western Roman Empire, by and large, collapses by the, uh, about the 5th century. You have all this political turmoil and political transformation in Western Europe, in Italy, and in Rome. During this period, you do have the sacking of Rome. Outsiders come in. They destroy parts of the city. They take the treasure from the city. And eventually, uh, by about the 10th, 11th century, we do see some stability appearing in Rome. Rome has become the center of the Western Christian Church. The bishops of Rome assume the titles of Pope, and they kind of dominate religion in the West. And Rome does become an important city once again because of its association with the Church. Uh, what's kind of remarkable about Rome, a city that has this long history, is that that period from about the 7th century to about the 15th century is uh, not really well preserved in the city. Obviously, there were lots of buildings that were constructed. There were lots of churches that were built. Some of those churches survived. But it isn't a place, you don't go to Rome to look at medieval history per se. You go to Rome to look at the ancient world. You go to Rome to look at uh, the late Renaissance and Baroque periods. That middle period in Roman history really is lost. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the Romans weren't build building stuff. The Roman people themselves were living in the ruins of ancient Rome. They were turning temples into their living rooms. They were tearing down the ancient structures to build the houses that they were living, living in at that time. So there really uh, is a lack of medieval architecture in Rome compared to the rest of the story. Now, it doesn't mean that there isn't anything from that time period. There are a couple of important churches that remain. One of them is this one, Santa Maria in Trastevere. Trastevere is the area across the Tiber River from the heart of Rome. That's the term Trastevere means, it means across the Tiber. And there is a, uh, was once a working class neighborhood there in Trastevere. This church becomes the center of that working class neighborhood. It is a built, uh, the church that we see today was built in the 12th century, but it was built on the remains of a 4th century church, which is believed to be the earliest Christian church in Rome. So it has a long history as a, as a sacred site. Um, and the church today is a good example of a 12th century Roman basilica. If you look at that form over here, that's a typical basilica church form. You can see the interior over here has this ornate floor, this uh, amazing coffered ceiling there, uh, gold mosaics throughout the interior, kind of typical of the decoration of that time. It is um, a significant church because it is from this time period, it is one of the few survivors from this time period in Rome. And the exterior of it, you can kind of make it out over here, you can certainly see it better here, is covered with these fantastic mosaics. Um, 12th century mosaics depicting female saints bringing gifts to the Madonna and child over here, enthroned in the center. Uh, these statues here are much later additions from the 16th and 17th century when the, the Roman church establishment needed to put statues everywhere, so they were throwing statues on these older churches. But this is the facade of Santa Maria in Trastevere. It has a nice piazza in front of it, a big fountain in the middle of the piazza. Typical Rome. 
but really, uh, in many ways, the, the heartbeat of the Trastevere neighborhood is this church right here. So uh, a nice example of a Roman medieval, high medieval church uh, that we see in Rome. Now, a short way away from Trastevere, from Santa Maria in Trastevere, uh, kind of moving toward the Vatican, is this building, Castel Sant'Angelo. Castel Sant'Angelo was originally constructed in the second century as the tomb, the mausoleum for the Emperor Hadrian. It was where the emperor was going to be entombed and enjoy eternity. Uh, over the course of its history, however, the mausoleum falls into disrepair, and in the 15th century, excuse me, the 14th century, uh, the mausoleum is reconfigured into a fortress. It is turned into a castle. It becomes the citadel of Rome. Uh, it was a place where, whenever Rome was attacked, the popes would find shelter. They would go scurry from the Vatican, from St. Peter's, over to Castel Sant'Angelo and hold out when Rome was besieged there. Uh, there's actually a little passageway, a covered passageway that connects the Pope's apartments in the Vatican with Castel Sant'Angelo. You can still see the, uh, the passageway as you walk along the streets of Rome. Now, um, the reason why this is called Castel Sant'Angelo has to do with a miracle that supposedly occurred here in the Middle Ages. Uh, it was in the 14th or 15th century. Rome was struck by plague. This plague epidemic, some disease was sweeping through Rome, causing tremendous death. And the people of Rome prayed to God for deliverance, for an end to the plague. Well, one day, supposedly, an angel appeared above the castle. And the angel sheathed his sword, and doing so, ended the plague in Rome. So the castle was named Castel Sant'Angelo, the holy angel. And on top of it was a statue of the angel placing his sword back in his sheath, thereby saving the city of Rome. Now, the statue that's up there today is not the original one. Uh, this is an 18th century, I believe, reproduction. The original one uh, was probably struck by lightning and I think destroyed, so it had to be replaced. So that's where that comes from. Um, that's where the, the castle gets its name. This is also the scene of um, one of the more popular Italian operas. One of the climaxes of an opera it takes place here in Castel Sant'Angelo. The opera Tosca. Oh, that's uh, where she jumps? When? <laughs> you just gave away the end of the opera. <laughs> uh, in Tosca, you have a spurned lover. And what does she do in desperation at the end of the opera? But she jumps to her death from the Castel Sant'Angelo into the waters of the Tiber River below. This is the setting for that. Now, uh, it has to be said that for Tosca to actually make that leap successfully, she would have to be uh, a better jumper than most Olympic long jumpers. <laughs> but uh, this is supposedly where that scene takes place, and she throws herself from the parapet to her death in the river below. Um, those opera heroines are so dramatic. Uh, so Castel Sant'Angelo, wonderful, uh, wonderful structure. It's a museum today. You can visit the papal apartments that are in there. There's a nice restaurant up here on the top with spectacular views over the city. Uh, really fantastic. This bridge that leads across the Tiber, we're kind of standing on the bridge right there, is also tremendously famous because, well, because of that. Uh, you have these sculptures of all the angels leading to it, and it really is a dramatic entryway into the castle across the river into the Tiber. So the, the Vatican is a little bit that way on our map, uh, or on our image. If we were to go to the, to the your left, we would end up heading toward the Vatican. Um, so we're seeing this kind of as an example of medieval architecture in Rome. There were palazzi that were built during this time period, the homes of the wealthy. Rome was a, a place where wealth was concentrated, and some noble families had a tremendous amount of wealth. And because it was the seat of the papacy, you had different states, different principalities, different kingdoms that had palaces in Rome where their ambassadors lived. One of those buildings that's built during the early 15th century is this one, Palazzo Venezia. Uh, Palazzo Venezia is kind of near one end of the Roman form. It was originally built as the home, it was built by the Venetian Republic as the home for the Venetian ambassadors to the Holy See, to the, to the papacy. So it was built as a diplomatic residence of sorts. But because it was built in the 15th century, it was built as a medieval fortified house. If we look at the, uh, the Palazzo Venezia, you have the crenellations here along the top, you have this tower over here. The architectural style was very much medieval. It was very much thinking of the defensive. 
how can we fortify the house, how can we defend the house if we have to. Even though it probably wasn't going to be attacked, it was still with that idea in mind. Now, I point this out uh, because the Palazzo Venezia does have kind of a, a uh, controversial modern history, which we'll talk about later on, but because I want to compare this 15th century building to a Roman palazzo that was built in the 16th century, the Palazzo Farnese. Very different style. What has occurred between the building of the Palazzo Venezia and the Palazzo Farnese? No fortifications. Well, no fortifications. And Italy has embarked on the Renaissance. Ah, the Renaissance, which begins pretty much in Florence in the first half of the 15th century, begins to change architecture, begins to change art, begins to change how we interpret the world around us. As a result of that, you see new architectural styles emerging. This is very much a Renaissance palazzo. It is very much built for comfort, not for defense. It was the home of the Farnese family, a wealthy Roman family. Some of the Farnese, are, a lot of the Farnese are cardinals, some of them become popes. They were sponsors of art and patrons of artists. Uh, they really are a significant family in, in the history of Rome and in the history of Italy. Um, so this was the palace that they built to live in comfort and in luxury. They had this nice piazza in front, of course the fountain. Rome has lots and lots of fountains, pretty much every around every corner. In every piazza you'll see a fountain. Uh, today, this is the French embassy in Rome. So the French are doing okay in Rome. <laughs> it's actually around the corner, or a short distance away from a church, an important church in Rome. It's called uh, San Luigi dei Francesi, or St. Louis of the French, which was built by the French community in Rome. Um, so it was the French church for the people, the French people in Rome. And that church is decorated with some, um, some paintings by Caravaggio. Uh, they're in a side chapel at one end of the church. It's the only place in Europe where Caravaggios are in situ, where the paint, hanging where they were meant to be hanging when he painted them. So it's pretty important because of that, and it's about a block or two away from the, the current French embassy. So this is an example of Renaissance Rome, a Roman palazzo, built for comfort, not for defense. These were luxury houses of the wealthy families. The cardinals and the popes spent some time over here. Now, as we head into the 16th century, we begin to see a transformation in Roman architecture, in Roman art. Um, and it's a transformation in which this guy does play a bit of a role. His name is Donato Bramante. Bramante was a, an important architect and builder in Rome. And we mention him by name because by this point in our story, the artist starts to become almost as, as important as the art. And the builder becomes as important as the building. A lot of those earlier structures were built anonymously. We don't know who the architects were, who the engineers were, who the designers were. By the time we get to the Renaissance and the period after the Renaissance, the artist is almost as important as the art that is being created. So here we have Bramante. One of Bramante's monuments that he constructs in Rome is this building here. It's called the Tempietto, or the Little Temple. And that was built around 1502 on the supposed site of the martyrdom of St. Peter. Uh, the Apostle. Peter goes to Rome, he is um, arrested and executed by the Romans on this site on a hill overlooking the, the downtown of Rome. Later on in the 14th, uh, 15th, 16th century, I'll get there eventually, this little temple is constructed there. Now it's a great example of Renaissance architecture. It's considered one of the purest forms of Renaissance architecture. The columns, the, the uh, balustrade up here, this beautiful little dome on top of it, all kind of achieving that Renaissance ideal in architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, there is kind of a, an interesting tie-in to this building with the United States. How can that possibly be? Well, who sponsored the building of this? Um, King and Queen of Spain named Ferdinand and Isabella, whose names you might be familiar with, because what do Ferdinand and Isabella do? Christopher they send Christopher Columbus, Columbus, they sponsor Christopher Columbus coming across the Atlantic Ocean, which opens up the uh, Atlantic Ocean, and all of a sudden you have a bunch of Europeans here in the Americas. So there is a tie between Bramante and Rome and the Renaissance and Ferdinand and Isabella, and ultimately kind of here. We really want to extend that tie and draw it out in a lot of elaborate ways. In any case, why do I mention Bramante? Because he does play an important role in shaping the city of Rome. He and this guy, 
you probably heard of him, um, will be contributors to building one of the great monuments, one of the great structures in Rome, St. Peter's Basilica. Michelangelo does come along and do the Sistine Chapel a little bit later on. Uh, St. Peter's Basilica. Now, St. Peter's was to be the central church of the, the Christian world, of Western Christendom. It was going to be the grand church where the popes hang, hung out and did whatever popes do. Um, now, the original St. Peter's was built in the 4th century. And it was, uh, by the time we get to the 14th century, a thousand years old and falling apart, as we all are when we reach a thousand. Um, and so what the popes decided is that they needed to build a new church, a grand church in the latest style. So what we begin to see in the 15th century is that the popes start raising money to build a new basilica in Rome to replace old St. Peter's with what will be new St. Peter's. Now, how do the popes raise money? To build this, they sell indulgences. And what are indulgences? You get out of jail free card, exactly. You could pay to have your sins forgiven. You get a ticket that says you lose so many years in purgatory. Now, if you were smart and you were wealthy, you could buy more indulgences than sins you had committed so that you can uh, freely commit sins for a while, I guess. In any case, the sale of indulgences does spark controversy in Europe. It does eventually lead to the... Uh, it's one of the causes for the outbreak of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther, the German monk, is offended by the sale of indulgences. That sparks everything in the, the early 16th century. Well, while that's going on, while Martin Luther is getting angry, the popes are, are paying people to design a new church in, in the Vatican, a new St. Peter's Basilica. This is what St. Peter's Basilica looks like today. And there are three uh, architectural names that are really associated with how it looks. Bramante, who drew up the original plan to replace the old St. Peter's. Michelangelo, who improved on Bramante's design. I'll show you the blueprints in a minute, or the designs in a minute. And then another guy, a century later, named Moderno. Moderno created what we see today, uh, this facade over here. Now, this facade has been criticized very heavily. Many people think that it is too tall, too big, and it actually obscures Michelangelo's dome. Um, we can debate that point if you'd like. But what we have, what we end up constructing here in Rome at the Vatican is the largest church in the world. Um, St. Peter's is immense. You kind of get a sense of that from the scale on the exterior. You can see the people up here. Uh, it's a, it is a massive, massive structure. Uh, and it is a church that is so big that generations of visitors upon entering the church are almost struck dumb by it because it is so overwhelming. The scale of the structure is so overwhelming. You don't have to be religious. You don't have to be spiritual at all to be kind of amazed at what the church, what the building looks like. In fact, our friend Mark Twain, while visiting Rome, went to St. Peter's and was at a loss for words on how to describe it. Now imagine Mark Twain at a loss for words. He was so <laughs> overwhelmed, he said he couldn't comprehend the scale of what he was seeing, just the monumentality of the building itself. So here are the plans of the various uh, designs for St. Peter's. This is what the original church looked like, a basilica design uh, with a courtyard in front of it. That's falling apart. We replaced that. This is Bramante's design, the shape of a Latin cross there with these, these corners with side chapels and things like that. That was the, the building plan to begin with. Well, Michelangelo comes along in the middle of the 16th century, looks at Bramante's plan and says, we need to fix this. There, there are some problems with this. What Michelangelo didn't like was that he thought there were too many dark corners in this design that would lead to the despoiling of nuns, is the phrase he uses, inside the church. So in order to lighten it up a little bit, to make it more open, he modified the design, still keeping that Greek cross plan, but kind of getting rid of all these little pillars and things right there, and designing that massive cupola dome that sits on top of the cathedral itself. And then, in the early 17th century, you have Moderna who extended the nave of the church and made that grand uh, front part over here, the thing we see as we approach uh, St. Peter's today. So the church would have looked very different when Michelangelo had built it, or had designed it, than what we see today in the, the modern world. Now, as I said, the church itself is enormous. Um, it is, I want to say, the length of two U.S. Capitol buildings on the interior. Um, this kind of gives you a sense of the scale. It is 
ridiculously big, uh, overwhelmingly large. Uh, here, we're standing at the entrance, looking down the, the main aisle, the nave of the church. This structure right here is the baldachin. We see it closer over here, which is a ceremonial covering that sits over the high altar. The high altar itself supposedly located over the burial spot of St. Peter the Apostle. Um, in fact, you can go down into the crypt and you can see St. Peter right there. Um, this is dwarfed by the enormous dome above it, which you see over here. Here we are looking down from the bottom of the dome into the church itself. And this is only about uh, two-thirds of the way down the church, so it extends beyond that for quite some distance. It is immense. Uh, it is such a giant, giant church. You can see the people down here uh, to give you a sense of how big a structure it actually is. Um, I took this picture when I was in Rome last uh, five years ago. And again, this is the baldachin above the altar. You can see the size of the people here in the foreground. And this itself is dwarfed by the rest of the structure. Uh, it is, however, very dramatic on the inside. And if you get there at the right time of day and you have the light streaming in through the windows that Michelangelo designed around the base of the dome, you get scenes like this. Uh, it is an amazing, amazing place. Uh, Love it or hate it, it does evoke reaction in people who arrive there. People are overwhelmed by the scale and the size. Uh, some people find it incredibly spiritual. Some people find it incredibly ridiculous, overwhelming. But it really is a magnificent, magnificent building. So Michelangelo is responsible for a lot of the architecture here. Lots of other artists contribute to the interior. Michelangelo is also responsible for designing one of the great public spaces in Rome, the uh, Piazza del Campidoglio. This is a public square, one of the, the finest Renaissance public squares in Italy, that is designed on top, that is placed on top of the Capitoline Hill, where the former Temple of Jupiter had been located overlooking the Roman Forum. The Roman Forum is right behind this building there. This, plant, this um, space was designed by Michelangelo in around 1538 to be a center of public activity and government activity in the city of Rome itself. We have three Renaissance palazzi around the building. Today, some of these are museums, some of them are government buildings. And then you have this elaborate tiling pattern, paving pattern on the piazza itself. The centerpiece of the piazza, uh, to get to the piazza, you have to go up this long staircase um, up to uh, the top of the hill overlooking the forum. The centerpiece of the piazza is this statue right here which is an equestrian bronze statue of the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius that dates from the second century. Uh, it is one of the rare surviving Roman equestrian monuments. Uh, most of the Roman, the equestrian monuments of Roman emperors were destroyed over the course of history, melted down, metal was used for other things. This one survived, and it survived for a couple of kind of uh, quirky reasons. One that it was thrown into the Tiber River. It stayed in the river for a long time. It was lost in the river. When it was finally recovered from the river, the people who found it thought that it represented the Emperor Constantine. And they wanted to preserve it. Why? Because Constantine legalizes Christianity in the Roman Empire. So they couldn't destroy Constantine. So they preserved it. Turns out it's actually the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. And it was placed here in the center of the Campidoglio by Michelangelo. Uh, kind of to, to complement that structure, an echo back to classical antiquity. The statue we see here on the screen is a reproduction. The original is now inside the Capitoline Museum, which is that building right over there. Um, so you can go and see the original, or you can just see the replica outside, depending on what you want to do next time you go to Rome. So uh, what we see is that Michelangelo does play a role in shaping the way that the city looks. Some city planning with the piazza, certainly architectural with the um, St. Peter's Basilica, artistic, of course, Sistine Chapel, sculptures all over the place. We're not going to get into what Michelangelo does. Um, but by the time we get to the 17th century, there are two other architects who come to dominate the Roman landscape, who leave a tremendous legacy in the shaping of Rome. And they're two men who are contemporaries who were bitter rivals. You have Francesco Borromini and Gian Lorenzo Bernini. Uh, pretty much everywhere you go in Rome, you will encounter Borromini and Bernini. Uh, they built sculptures, they built churches, they built, they designed piazzas, 
Uh, Bernini seemed to, seemed to design every other fountain in Rome. Mm -hmm. uh, his work is all over the place. And the two men really despised each other. They were bitter, bitter rivals. They were competing for the same commissions for the same rich uh, Roman families. They did not get along. They ridiculed each other in the press. Uh, I'm surprised they didn't come to blows at some time. They were just <laughs> not, not friendly with one another at all. They were real, uh, real artistic competitors, but that competition, this rivalry, probably aided to their, uh, contributed to their genius and their daring in their art. What we see coming out of Rome by the time we get into the early 17th century is a new artistic style that comes to be called the Baroque. When you think of the Baroque, what do you think of? Excesses, lots of angels and flowers and all sorts of things all over the place. The Baroque is actually a development of Rome. It emerges in Rome. And it's a reaction to the Protestant Reformation. The, in Protestant areas, the churches were being stripped down. Statues were taken out. Paintings were covered up. The walls were painted white. In Rome, they said, we're going in the opposite direction. We're going to overwhelm you with decoration and color and shape and sculpture. And these two men were in the forefront of that movement, creating the Baroque and perpetuating the Baroque in the city of Rome. One of the great Baroque structures designed by Borromini was this church. The Sant'Ivo alla Sapienza, which is the chapel of the law school of the University of Rome. It was designed and built by Borromini uh, in the middle of the 17th century, as you can see there by the dates. And it is a fascinating building. It has one of the most unique domes in Rome. Uh, I don't know if you can make it out over here, but the cupola isn't a regular dome. It's actually a corkscrew spiral that goes up and up. And the interior of the building is this right here, looking up into the dome, not your normal dome shape. In fact, it's almost like you have a, um, a rounded triangle over here and a truncated triangle over there. Now, some people think that that shape looks like a bee. A bee, not the animal, the insect, not the letter B. And there's a reason for that. The family that commissioned the building of this was the Barberini family. And the Barberini emblem was the honeybee. So you have Borromini commissioned by the Barberini family to build this. He incorporates the symbol of the bee throughout in the shape of this, but also throughout all the decoration. These what look like flowers going up are actually honeybees sculpted into the dome itself. So you have that celebration of the Barberini family very subtly, if you don't know, uh, in the design of Sant'Ivo alla Sapienza. Uh, Sant'Ivo, by the way, is the patron saint of lawyers. Um, so that's why it's at the law school of La Sapienza. Sapienza is the name of the University of Rome. And that brings us to really the, the greatest arena where the rivalry between Borromini and Bernini played out. One of the great public spaces in Rome, Piazza Navona. Piazza Navona is really a, a fantastic place where uh, a lot of the energy and a lot of the life of Rome does occur. It is in a long, narrow piazza because it is built on the remains of what was once a Roman imperial racetrack. Uh, the chariots used to go here, the, 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 the arena of Domitian. Uh, it does become this public square in Rome. Uh, we see here, this is an 18th century depiction of Piazza Navona. And the reason why this is the arena in which the rivalry between Borromini and Bernini plays out is because the two centerpieces of this square, this church right here and that fountain right there, were each built by one of those rivals. Uh, the church is the church of Santa Nies in Agone. Um, and it is a, it was built as the private family chapel of the Pamphili family. The Pamphili were tremendously wealthy uh, Romans. In fact, some of the Pamphili become Rome, become uh, popes, excuse me. This is the Pamphili family palace right here. And the church was attached to the palace and had a secret passageway so that the family could go from their palace into the church to see mass without having to mingle with the, uh, the common people, and then go back to their palace. Um, it is Borromini who is commissioned to design the facade of the palace that, of the church that we see right here. And what we have is a pretty pure expression of the Baroque style. It's not a flat facade. It kind of has these curves to it, these ebbs and flows. It goes concave and then it comes out. And you see the uh, the garlands along the top here, the angels that are sculpted into it. It is an elaborate, elaborate facade. Um, and it is 
an important architectural statement in Piazza Navona as being associated with the Pamphili family. Now, when the, I can't remember which pope it was, but the one, the Pamphili who was pope, does have, um, prefers Borromini to Bernini. Part of the reason for that is because Bernini had fallen out of favor with the papacy. One of Bernini's projects had been to build two massive bell towers on the front of St. Peter's Basilica. Well, the first one of those towers was built, and it became structurally unstable and had to be taken down. And it was a great embarrassment for Bernini. Borromini made sure that everybody knew that Bernini failed at the building. The church tower. And Bernini had kind of fallen out of favor with the, with the authorities in Rome. And he was struggling for commissions. He couldn't get a, anybody to hire him because, because of that embarrassment. Um, so what he does is he finds out that the Pamphili family wants to put a fountain in front of their church there in the middle of Piazza Navona. And all the artists in Rome are uh, invited to submit a design for this fountain, all the artists in Rome except Bernini. So he's really on the outs. Well, what does Bernini do? He has one of his friends, who happens to be a cardinal, sneak a model of his design into the uh, Pamphili family home, uh, kind of in a corridor that the Pope has to walk by. And the Pope one day shows up, walks by this model of the fountain, and stops and looks at it, and is shocked by its beauty, and says, who did this? I need to have this built in front of my house. And he's told it's Bernini, and he goes, of course it's Bernini. How can I not fall in love with the Bernini? So Bernini gets a commission to build the fountain that is directly in front of Borromini's church. That is the fountain of the four rivers, representing the four rivers of the world, or the four major rivers of the world as they were interpreted at that time. Um, the fountain supports an Egyptian obelisk, which is brought from Egypt and placed here in the center of Rome. Uh, this, uh, this actually in antiquity, that obelisk is brought here. It was over by the Vatican. It's transported across the city to be placed here in Piazza Navona. Um, and what we see is that Bernini creates these four figures representing those four major rivers. Um, I'm going to forget what they are. But in any case, representing Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Americas. So four rivers in those places. And it is directly in front of Borromini's church right there. Now, the tour guides in Rome, oh, I had, I had notes, actually. It's the Nile, the Danube, the Ganges, and the Rio de la Plata. Those are the four rivers. Um, now, the tour guides in Rome will tell you that Bernini built his statue here, his statues here as a way of insulting Borromini's design. Two of the statues that are facing Borromini's church over here are looking the other way or have their hands up as if trying to obscure their view of Borromini's church. Um, so it's a nice legend about the fountain. There's not really much truth in it because the two things were built simultaneously, so Bernini couldn't have possibly planned that. But you do have this representation of these rivers right there in the center of Piazza Navona in front of Borromini's church. And of the two, which one becomes more famous? It's the fountain. Everybody looks at the fountain, people ignore the church behind them. So I guess Bernini kind of wins this round through some trickery and, and through his artistic <laughs> skill. So uh, we have that going on. Now, the public spaces in Rome are almost as important as the buildings in Rome. Rome is a city that lives outdoors. And we have Piazza Navona as one of those great public places. Another important square in Rome is the Campo dei Fiori, or the Field of Flowers. Uh, this has for many, many centuries been one of the great public marketplaces in Rome. There are um, fruit and vegetable markets in the morning, and then uh, other sellers show up in the afternoon to sell whatever goods they are selling. And it has played a historic role in the city of Rome. One of the oldest hotels in the world was located here. One of the first hotels in the world was located here in Campo dei Fiori. Pilgrims coming to Rome, visitors coming to Rome, could find lodgings in some of these buildings around the square. And in the center of Campo dei Fiori is this statue, uh, here's a close-up of it, of a man named Giordano Bruno. Does anybody know Giordano Bruno? He's got a car dealership on this one. <laughs> <laughs> he sells jeeps. Uh, Giordano Bruno was actually burned at the stake as a heretic, right there in the center of Campo dei Fiori. Now, why was he burned as a heretic? Well, in the uh, late 16th century, he had the nerve to publicly announce that he thought that the sun was the center of the solar system and that other suns had planets revolving around them, basically going counter to the teachings of the church. Now, he's burned as a stake as a heretic here during the period when the Pope owns and controls all of Rome. After the establishment of the Kingdom of Italy 
and Rome becoming part of the kingdom of Italy in the uh, 19th century, the people of Rome, as kind of a uh, subtle middle finger salute to the Pope, <laughs> dedicated a statue to Giordano Bruno right there on the site where he had been uh, executed. So you have a long, complex social history of Rome playing out here in this square in the center of the city itself. Uh, it is a beautiful spot. It is very crazy and crowded when the markets are, are uh, operational. At night, you have a bunch of cafes and restaurants around it, so you can get a drink there and kind of gaze up at Giordano Bruno uh, while he gazes down at you. Uh, and that brings us to another famous square, uh, and a, perhaps the most famous fountain in Italy, perhaps one of the most beautiful fountains in all of Europe, the Trevi Fountain. Uh, I have to tell you that the square in which the Trevi Fountain is located is pretty disappointing. It's not much bigger than this room, <laughs> and it is always packed with tourists. Uh, but the fountain itself is spectacular, as you can see right here. Now, the name Trevi actually has ancient origins. It's an area where three roads came together, three roads that were accompanied by aqueducts. Ancient Roman aqueducts brought water into the city, into this location. So in the 18th century, when this, this um, fountain was constructed, it was in that location where there was this natural source of water. This is really one of the great examples of um, Baroque public architecture and public sculpture in the city of Rome itself. Now, the reason why I put the Trevi Fountain into this talk it was, one, because it's beautiful, but also because it gives me the opportunity to put Anita Eckberg on the Okay. Uh, uh, of course, famously in the movie from 1961, La Dolce Vita, by Federico Fellini, Anita Ekberg, Marcello Mastroianni go for a swim or a, a dance there yeah. in the Trevi Fountain. I do not recommend that for you. You will get arrested. Yeah. Um, but, you know, cinema. Um, so we have that. Uh, that brings us to this building. This is called Altare della Patria, or the, the Altar of the Fatherland. And it is a very um, somewhat controversial building in the city of Rome. This was built as a monument to Victor Emmanuel II, the first king of a united Italy. It was meant to celebrate the unification of Italy. And it was built in a tremendously monumental style. It is a big structure plunked down right in the middle of Rome, right next to the Roman Forum. And it was, for decades, very controversial. A lot of Romans hated this building. Uh, in fact, they gave it kind of uh, derogatory nicknames. They called it the wedding cake because it's a big white structure in the middle of the city. Sometimes they called it the typewriter because it kind of has this look like an old style typewriter. Yeah. It is this monument that's meant to celebrate Roman unifi or Italian unification. Uh, it also becomes the, the site of the um, Italian tomb of the unknown soldier from the First World War. So it does become kind of a sacred site in Rome because of that, but it is, for much of its history, a controversial monument. Um, lately, in the last couple of decades, that idea has been reassessed, and many people think that this is a fitting monument for Rome, because it's very much how the ancient Romans would have built. The monuments that the Romans built were these big, glaring, heavy, elaborate structures, and that's certainly what we have with this. Now, part of the reason why this building is controversial, other than its um, overwhelming design, is because of some history that's associated with it. This is at one end of Piazza Venezia. The Palazzo Venezia is at the other end. During the fascist era in Rome, who was, whose office was in the Palazzo Venezia? Mussolini. Mussolini. And he liked to gather his followers in Piazza Venezia so he could speak to them from this balcony over here. And inevitably, what was the backdrop of that scene when it was recorded and photographed? The Altare della Patria, the monument to Victor Emmanuel II. So it does have this kind of tainted history, although the structure itself doesn't have really have anything directly to do with Mussolini other than this, this background and that it was completed during his reign over Italy. Um, but it certainly does tie the 20th century with the 19th century with the idea of ancient Roman imperial power, which is something that Mussolini played with a lot. Now with that said, with the introduction of, of Mussolini and the fascists, Mussolini viewed himself as a new Roman emperor who wanted to create a new Roman empire. And like other Roman emperors, what did he do? He commissioned buildings. He commissioned the, the construction of a forum, which becomes known as the Foro Mussolini, Mussolini's Forum, kind of on the outskirts of Rome. And he had builders 
using the latest uh, fascist architectural styles, construct modern Roman buildings. One of the most famous of these fascist Roman buildings is this structure here, Palazzo della Civita, or the, or the Palace of uh, Civilization, mm -hmm. um, which is also nicknamed the Square Colosseum. <laughs> Why would it have that nickname? Well, look at all the arches. You have all the arches, you have these classical style statues in there. Uh, obviously, when Mussolini um, falls during the Second World War, the name Foro Mussolini is, is wiped away, and it does become a part of the city of Rome. It is an architectural uh, example of modernist architecture in Rome. Uh, today, there's a museum that's in this building. Um, and the buildings around it, which are all built in a similar style, really reflect kind of the, the fascist outlook toward architecture. It's cold, it's impersonal, it's, it's echoing the grandeur of the past, but it really isn't as beautiful as the past. Um, very typical of fascist architecture. It brings me to this image here. <laughs> that is a palazzo in uh, the center of Rome, right near the, the uh, Piazza Navona. Uh, a short walk from the Pantheon and a short walk from the Campo dei Fiori. That is a Renaissance palazzo. But during the fascist era, this was the headquarters of the Italian fascist party. And they decorated the exterior of it, of it with this, which um, you can see it says C, 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 C. Yes, 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 yes. And this looming kind of terrifying visage of Mussolini himself. Uh, and what we see reflected in that is certainly the, the fascist ideology of power. It is power. Mussolini's face there looming down at us, and what are we expecting to say? Yes, 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 yes. So we see architecture as politics playing out here in the 20th century. Um, there's actually a pretty decent restaurant right down this road over here. <laughs> it has nothing to do with Mussolini, but I thought I'd point that out. There's a good gelateria on this side of the road. Yeah. We will leave this image and kind of end with this. Uh, this panorama of Rome. Um, you know, it went very quickly through the long architectural history of Rome. I pointed out some highlights. I skipped so many buildings and so much art and architecture in the city. You could spend a lifetime walking around Rome, looking at the buildings, learning the stories, learning the history. Again, you have nearly 3,000 years of history in Rome. And there is a, a legacy of the built environment that stretches for thousands of years across the city. It is a magnificent city. It is a chaotic city. Uh, if you think of Italian politics in the 20th century, and you have like a new president being elected every three weeks or stuff yeah. like that, um, that kind of chaos is really reflected in Rome itself. It is overcrowded, it is loud, it is hot in the summertime, but it is a magnificent city. And this view here kind of encapsulates that. Uh, here we see San Agnese, there's San Ivo, there's the Vittoriano, the, Vic the monument to Victor Emmanuel. You can just make out the Colosseum kind of looming here in the background. You can see everything in Rome, all the monuments right here. Um, Rome is a city of thousands of churches. And if you really wanted to go insane, you could try to visit every church in Rome. I don't know if that's actually physically possible to do, but it is a, a wonderful city, a magnificent place. Um, the food's not bad either. So uh, anyway, this was our quick tour through the architecture of Rome, the history of Rome, uh, telling a story, hopefully whetting your appetite for those of you who are going on the trip in two months. I think it is something like that, April, early April. So if you're going on a trip, enjoy yourself. Um, stay safe. Try not to get lost in the chaos of Rome. Um, and the rest of you, well, I hope you enjoyed this. And I hope uh, you have your passports ready. You can plan your own trips. So uh, good seeing you all. Thank you.